What's going on, folks? Welcome to episode five of the Next Man Up Injury Podcast. I am your host, as always, Kyle Allen. I am joined once again by the uber talented duo of Matthew Walters and Eric Crail. As we're recording this episode, the Hall of Fame game is taking place in Canton, Ohio, which traditionally marks the beginning of the preseason. Speaking of preseason, who are some names you guys have been bumping up your draft boards after seeing some camp footage and hearing the buzz on Twitter? Matthew? So. I'm going to say a name that I was high on even before camp started and everything. I really like Michael Carter. I know it's the Jets, and I know they're going to be bad, but he is getting first-team reps. All things coming out of camp are good. Um, And I do kind of want to make a declaration here that he is going to score more fantasy points his rookie season than Trey Sermon is going to, because I know a lot of people are high on Trey Sermon, and I just want to go ahead and get that out there. Yeah, I feel like the opportunity is definitely there for him to do that. It for sure is, and I know people love the the system that Trey Sermon's in, but uh, the coaching staff at the Jets came from that same 49er system, so it should be good for Michael Carter too, and the opportunity is yep. a lot better. Absolutely, that 49ers backfield is crowded. Anybody else you're looking at? A couple other names I really like. Uh, Kylan Granson, the tight end for the Colts. Hearing really good things about him. Um, tight end position. I've been working on some articles and stuff that really point out that the tight end position is lacking. So if you can find that diamond in the rough and they take off, you need to grab it. So I've been grabbing him everywhere There's just as a stash to hope that he kind of breaks out. But I would, I'd like to hear who Eric's kind of looking at in camp and everything as well. Well, my two risers are a bit more well-known, and it's Brian Edwards and Devonta Smith. So Edwards was an analytics darling who we know didn't stand out year one, but his camp reviews are crazy right now. And I'm not just talking about John Gruden. They let Tyrell Williams walk away, and someone has to step up in that offense not named Darren Waller. So... In my mind, Edwards is a perfect by-low freshman face planner. And I think if anyone's going to have 1,000 yards in that offense besides Darren Waller, it's probably Brian Edwards. Woo! <laughs> I think, and I think that Devonta Smith, he has been getting the praise from camp that we expect from a first-round draft pick. But on top of that, the rumors are growing that Deshaun Watson may be traded to the Eagles this year. And I think that's a real possibility. If you listen to the coach speak, whenever they're asked if Jalen Hurts is a starter and whether or not they're vying for a Watson trade, their answers are incredibly vague. And to me, that means something. I mean, like when Sean McVay was asked if they were bringing in a veteran running back, the answer was clear. When Carson Wentz got injured, their head coach's answer was clear. They're happy with the guys that they have. So to me, a combination of a talented player who's earning the praise that we expect early on and maybe getting passes from a top 10 QB is enough for me to move Devonta Smith up my board. Yeah. Quarterback up trade would certainly serve him. Well, are you worried at all with this minor knee strain he's dealing with? Not right now. I think he has enough time before uh, the regular season start to take care of that. Yeah. It seemed like a fairly insignificant injury from the reports I'm hearing. And obviously we hope to see him recover well as a young player. Now, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to bookmark our last few episodes in which we broke down the other three divisions in the NFC and take a listen. You can find them by searching for the Next Man Up Injury Podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts, by following the link that I'll post in our description here, or by visiting rideordynasty.com and looking under the podcast tab. Now to get right to it, on this episode, we'll be dissecting the NFC South team by team and discussing the most fantasy relevant injury concerns. For the sake of organization, we'll go in the order of their finishes in the conference from last season. So we'll kick it off with the NFC South champion, New Orleans Saints. Now, the big headline in fantasy and regular football is Michael Thomas. We know he battled a high ankle sprain throughout the year last season, and he's going to miss the beginning of the season after undergoing ankle surgery in June. Matthew, what can you tell us about Thomas's outlook for 2021, and when can we expect him to be back to 100%? He's had two surgeries this offseason on his ankle that he injured last year. One was reportedly right after the season finished, 
and one was reportedly in June. Now, the June one kind of piecing together some things from Sean Payton apparently could have been done sooner, but Michael Thomas waited on it for one reason or another. And now it really gives him about a four-month timeline from them, which puts him sometime in October, probably being, probably being back from it, which kind of is a real drag for this season and makes things difficult dynasty-wise as he is a older... I say older, he's only 28, but in dynasty terms, that's basically ancient to some people. He is older and... Now is dealing with this injury, coming off surgeries, has QB tr turmoil, to say the least. It's all just kind of this conundrum of murky outlook for 2021. Now, when he's healthy, there's no one else on the team to throw the ball to, really. So he should be the guy and should be Michael Thomas of old. But can we count on him being healthy and... Can we count on him? Some things, if you take Sean Payton's word for it, maybe he waited a little too long to have it, and maybe he doesn't quite care enough to come back from it. I'm not saying that. I'm reading into Coach Speak, which I don't normally like to do, but there's a lot of question marks surrounding Thomas, his injury, and his outlook going forward, and it's kind of scary, really. Yeah, if I'm in a startup right now, I'm trying to avoid Michael Thomas. Despite the talent and the production of the past, he's just at such a weird value right now. I have him on one of my dynasty rosters, and I I put him on the trade block before he even or before it was announced that he had this second operation, and I didn't even get a bite. Nobody even messaged me about him. He's almost unsellable. Like it's impossible to get something that you feel is fair value for him yeah and that's what I found it was coming into this season I didn't know what to do with him without Drew Brees because if they end up with it doesn't really matter Taysom Hill didn't really utilize him as much as Brees did when he was um, the quarterback and Jameis Winston is known as more of a downfield threat which it is often talked about that Michael Thomas is not the downfield threat in that offense so I kind of worry about his value. I don't think he'll have that wide receiver one upside that he has in the past. And now with this nagging ankle injury, I'm even more concerned. But obviously, I'm not going to be able to move him for what I think he would be valued as, as a healthy asset. I want to go a little bit off the cuff here. I didn't put this in our show notes because of something you just mentioned, Matthew. You said he's 28. You mentioned that in Dynasty, that's almost ancient. I think that's a lot to do with the consensus is theory and dynasty. I feel like people get really excited in dynasty about rookies and want to, I'm doing air quotes, even though nobody can see me on a audio podcast, air quotes, everybody wants to rebuild all the time. And there's such a fascination with rebuilding and having a ton of picks and being able to get all the rookie players. I'm fairly new to dynasty. I haven't played more than three years now, but I've found that after a startup, even if you win a championship, okay, that tells me that you're good at redraft. Now compound it and be in the playoffs consistently. For you guys, in dynasty strategy, do you try to have two or three years where you're a contender and then rebuild it? Or do you constantly try to make moves to just maintain yourself as a contender? Because the way I look at it, why wouldn't you just make moves every year to try to remain in contention all the time? It's kind of silly to me to want to rebuild. Yeah, I think that a lot of people mistake rebuilding for actually just trading themselves out of contention year after year. Um, I mean, most young players take a couple years to develop into their peak athlete. So if you keep recycling to the youngest player, to the rookie, the second year, you're going to miss these peak performances that occur when players are like 26 through 27 if you're a wide receiver. Um, and especially if, when we're talking about Michael Thomas, I mean, there's tons of good wide receivers who are performing into their, you know, early thirties. Robert Woods is 29. Adam Thielen is 30. They're good receivers. You should be able to get good value for them. It wasn't more than 12 months ago that Michael Thomas was being drafted in the first round of startups. So, I mean, I agree that it's tough to trade for him this year just because of the immediate return 
discount that you're going to have to accept if you take him. But I think that to your point, you know, the rookie fever sometimes kills you. You know, you got to have a balanced roster because the point is to win this year, not three years from now. Especially for me, if I'm in a paid league, I don't want to voluntarily rebuild. Like I'm happily going to trade to try to keep myself in contention. I think you communicated that perfectly by saying you're constantly trading yourself out of contention. And I mean, I have friends that do it and that's fine because they just line my wallet every year. You love to see it. My wife gets a better Christmas present. She appreciates it. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I agree with Eric completely. I feel like Dynasty in a sense, really, you have to hone your ability to evaluate. And I don't mean like evaluate talent and stuff like that. I mean, you can follow people and you can get all that, but evaluate your own team on when to actually hit that rebuild and understand like, my team is garbage. Like I had a, I picked up an orphan team this past year and a guy tried to trade me. I mean, it was an awful trade, obviously. But it was like Nikhil, Nikhil Harry and a third for Joe Mixon. And when I called him out on it, he basically couldn't admit to himself that Nikhil Harry is not very good. Because he drafted him high two years ago and didn't want to give up. And it's like, you have to be able to look at yourself and say, I made a mistake here. I need to fix it somehow. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I hate that you had to use Nikhil Harry as the example because he's somebody that I loved coming in, both as a football fan and a Patriots fan, and I had very high hopes for. And he just, he just, yeah, he let me down big time. To be fair, apparently he's making plays in camp right now, and uh, I kind of like where his value's at because you can get him for next to nothing. So, (laughs) yeah, he requested a a trade, right? He requested a trade right before uh, training camp started, so he's got to start playing well now so he can actually boost his value oh, and go oh, somewhere now he good. has to start playing well. Okay. Right. Now he's going to be Not the past motivated. two years, but now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Sorry. That was my, my tangent of the evening. Back to the Saints. Let's talk IDP and look at Quan Alexander. Quan Alexander has re-signed with the Saints after suffering an Achilles injury last December. Now, Eric, you had a fantastic thread on Twitter after the news broke of Cam Akers' Achilles injury. Can you give us some insight as to what recovery looks like for these sorts of injuries what we can, and what we can expect from these two very different athletes? Yeah, so one thing we have to be diligent about when talking about serious injuries like Achilles is to, as closely as possible, compare apples to apples. So an Achilles injury to Akers is not the same as Quan. Um, my opinion on Cam's recovery is lukewarm, whereas my opinion on Quan's is kind of bleak. Um, I think it's easy enough. You should take a look at my thread on Twitter at FF underscore Nighthawk if you want more on Acres. But, you know, when we compare linebackers to linebackers, this position is typically hit the hardest by an Achilles injury in terms of post-operative performance and games played. We know that. So, there is a chance to overcome this, but some factors that work in Quan's favor, um, well, against Quan's favor, I'm sorry, are his age. He's 27, so it's going to take a, a little bit longer to heal. Um, his draft pick capital, he was a day three draft pick, so the team might not feel like it's that big a deal if he doesn't start as many games. Um, and it's time to recover because he won't be at... 12 months until the season is practically over. And that's an important calendar marker for the healing of that anatomy. That all said, it's a positive sign that the team re-signed him already because, you know, that might indicate some good internal discussions between the admin and medical staffing where it's similar to Saquon Barkley early on in his rehab where the team, you know, took their time evaluating Uh, his rehab, talking to the medical staff, and they picked up his fifth-year option well before preseason started. So you can kind of look at those as indicators as to how well this athlete is healing, is recovering. But, you know, there are known factors that play against Quan's recovery and and Akers, for that matter. Yeah, I think you summed that up perfectly. There's a lot of factors playing against him, and it'll certainly be interesting to see what happens with that. It's 
I guess it's encouraging that they re-signed him. The medical staff there, I guess, has some confidence, but we'll have to wait and see what happens and what he looks like when he returns to play. I'll make sure that we put a link to your Cam Akers thread in the description as well for people to check that out. Now let's move on. Next up, we have the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Kicking it off for the Bucs, we have O.J. Howard. He was a solid prospect coming out of Alabama that many viewed as a candidate to join the top-tier tight ends after polishing his game a little bit in the league. But a string of tough luck injuries has slowed him down, and it doesn't look like he's making quite as fast of a climb to the top of the stack as we had hoped. He suffered a foot fracture towards the end of 2018, missed time in 2019 with a hamstring injury, then had an Achilles injury as well last year. Now, Matthew, we know that the two things we look for when determining injury risk are advancing age and injury injury history. Howard is still only 26 years old, but his lower body injuries are beginning to stack up. When is it time to give up hope on him in Dynasty? Yeah, his lower body kind of feels like it's made of glass (laughs) at this point. Now, I get it. We don't like to call people injury-prone or anything like that, but it does seem like he is getting injured and injured and injured, and it almost seems like they got progressively worse. I mean, his Achilles rupture last year. I personally would probably already give up hopes in Dynasty, and I actually kind of found an article uh, when researching this Achilles, his Achilles injury, that kind of helps point to that, and this is kind of something to take into consideration for Quan Alexander who we just talked about and Cam Akers and Eric did have a great thread on it on Twitter but this at uh, this article these researchers they looked at prof- all professional athletes who well not all but 62 professional athletes that met their inclusion criteria for an Achilles tear 25 of those were the NBA, 32 were NFL, and 5 were MLB. So they kind of got it from all the professional sports. Basically, okay, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. They found that 30% of them actually could never um, return to play. They just could not get back to form and could not get back out there. Of all the others, they really found that it took two years to get back to proper form and back to it. In that first year back, they they had fewer games, less play time, and performed at a lower level than their pre-injury status, and it really took to that two-year mark for them to get back to proper form. So basically what they found is there's a 30% chance if you tear your Achilles at the professional level that you're never even going to return to the field again. And then after that, if you do, the odds are it's going to take two years to really get back to form. Now, obviously, this is just one article, and there's tons of factors for every injury, but that was really eye-opening. Yeah, when you have a guy like O.J. Howard that has a documented history of injury, especially multiple soft tissue injuries, it's certainly not encouraging to hear statistics like that surrounding his most recent ailment. Moving on. Let's talk about the GOAT, the inevitable one, the ageless wonder, Tom Brady. We know that he and his right-hand man, Alex Guerrero, have developed the TB12 method, which is arguably just the fountain of youth, but some may be interested to learn that Brady allegedly played the entire season last year on a torn MCL and still led his team to a Super Bowl. While it's not expected to affect him much in the future, the Bucs could be looking at some penalties being handed down from the league related to proper reporting of injuries. Eric, what can you tell us about the league's injury reporting policy and how it might affect Tampa Bay next year? Okay, so I'm going to read a snippet from the NFL policy, and it's kind of long, so wait until I say unquote, because that's going to be the end of of, uh, that piece. But it states, We're strapping in. (laughs) If any player has a significant or noteworthy injury, it must be listed on the practice report, even if he fully participates in practice, and the team expects that he will play in the team's next game. This is especially important for key players whose injuries may be covered extensively by the media, like quarterbacks. The information must be credible, accurately, timely, and specific within the guidelines of the policy, which is of paramount importance to maintaining the integrity of the game. Unquote. So 
Tom Brady and the Patriots don't necessarily have the best track records of following NFL policies. And at first glance, it seems like this was a clear violation of the injury reporting policy. But, I mean, ultimately, there's there's probably just too many unknowns to really punish the club. I mean, who's to say, theoretically, that Tom Brady never reported it to anyone? How would anyone know? I think it's tough to look back and to say, gotcha, um, when this is something that is really subjective and theoretically could be unknown or hidden allegedly it was going on all season so if it happened in training camp if it happened before the season even started he may not have said anything like you're saying i was able to find somewhere that it did mention mike evans was interviewed and he said that he knew there was something wrong and brady was hurting but he didn't know how bad it really was or what exactly the injury was so it's kind of interesting to see like somebody who has such a close rapport, you know, one of the starting wide receivers would notice like, hey, something's off. This might be our first season together, but like I can tell that you're not comfortable right now. But he didn't know what it was. So that makes me wonder if it's, you know, the TB12 systems trying to cover up what actually happened. You know, what would be interesting. I'm thinking my conspiracy theory would be that I think that you could maybe look back on those games and see if he was wearing a knee brace for any of those games, because an MCL plays a really important role for knee stability. And, I mean, if you were to rupture it or even partially rupture it, just walking feels unstable. So I wonder if you couldn't replay the tape and see if he has a brace on, because that would indicate to me that he told someone and that they tried to address it on the DL. But... That's a new thought. I hadn't. I don't know what that looks like in real life. Well, it would be tough to know because he did tear his ACL and his left knee several years ago, so he always wears some sort of brace on that leg. Mm. So it would be tough to know, of course, if there was any difference being made there. Now, you may be able to really break it down and look at mechanics and stuff like that, but you unfortunately wouldn't have the dead giveaway. Yeah, I mean, the mechanics wouldn't be enough to nail a team and punish them for any reason but um, and fortunately for him and the bucks he's not known for his running prowess <laughs> yeah i think i think the bucks are fine i don't know brian Erlacher might tell us differently tom brady loves the qb sneak what do you mean <laughs> i believe he is still the new england patriots record holder for goal line touchdown rushes amazing yep they Go. were all one or two yards without question <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about the Atlanta Falcons. Fortunately for Atlanta, who boasted the first all-first-round offense in NFL history last season, they have remained fairly healthy this far through camp. They did, however, add two offensive linemen and one defensive lineman to the pup list, including former first-rounder Caleb McGarry, which has permitted third-rounder rookie Jalen Mayfield to take some snaps with the first-team offensive line this season. On our last episode, we discussed offensive line health and how it plays into draft strategy, specifically how we look at the running back position. I know I asked Eric that question. He had some good points on it. So my question for both of you is, are you fading Mike Davis or any of the other Falcons offensive players because of concerns for offensive line health this early in the season? Matthew? I'm not fading Mike Davis because of lineman health. I'm fading Mike Davis because he's Mike Davis. <laughs> Valid. Because, I mean, he's been a career backup. I mean, he did something last year with the system that utilized the running back 99% of the time with Christian McCaffrey, and then McCaffrey goes out, and they just need someone to fill that role. They're not going to change their entire offense all of a sudden to not utilize the running back anymore, and he did great. It was awesome, but it's still Mike Davis. He's not, he's not a world beater by any means. All right, but you don't think that it's a big deal that – he was brought in with a new offensive coordinator. Who is it? Arthur Smith from the Titans. You know that they're going to want to be running the ball, and they chose Mike Davis and no one else. Yeah. That is interesting, but maybe they just couldn't get anyone else. I don't know. <laughs> that could be. But you know that Arthur Smith is going to want to run the ball. That's that's his style of offense. And the guy that's that true. he chose was Mike Davis. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Mike Davis is obviously no Derrick Henry. However, there is another interesting running back that I know I have to give Matthew a little bit of time to gush about. 
How you feeling about that Falcons backfield, Matthew? So so yes, I do like JVN Hawkins. I he actually was my RB ten coming into the draft, and I know he went undrafted because of his size and no one likes him. But dude was electric at Louisville. He had fifteen hundred rushing yards in twenty nineteen. And then, yeah, he had a little bit of a down year in 2020, but he still ended that year with 16 receptions. So he can play, and he's making plays at camp. And like I just said, Mike Davis is Mike Davis, so they're not going to just feed Mike Davis the ball. They need someone else to come in. Now, I'm not saying Hawkins is going to come in and just be a world beater and end in the top 20 RBs, but I I truly believe there's going to be a role for him on that team. And if you got deep roster spots, especially in Dynasty, he still might be on waivers. Go add this guy. There is definitely a wide receiver you can cut that should not be ahead of Hawkins for you. Might be the stash pick of the year. Just might be. Hawkins is also on. He's on my bench, too, in another league. Ooh, we got some believers at the next man up. All right, next up. Last but certainly not least, at least for fantasy, we have the Carolina Panthers. Now, before we get into too much, we need to talk about Keith Kirkwood. He has made headlines earlier this week, so I felt like we should at least share an update despite him not being super fantasy relevant. So after he suffered a scary blow to the head and neck from defensive back JT Ebay, Kirkwood laid on the ground for approximately 10 minutes while being attended to by the athletic trainers and the medical team before he was taken out on a stretcher to the hospital. Now, eBay was removed from practice immediately after the play and has since been waived by the Panthers. Fortunately, Kirkwood was released from the hospital. He was diagnosed with a concussion. No other injuries were reported. And he's since returned to team facilities and is reportedly doing well. Now, Eric, how do you feel about the Panthers cutting eBay over this? I feel good about it. Um, Safety is obviously a, a big emphasis in the NFL more recently, and if you look at it just from an admin perspective, these hits have become big liabilities for teams and player fines from a player perspective. You know, you have to protect your own and especially in the off season where, you know, you're vying for a spot, but not at the cost of another person's body, you know? Um, I mean, you're supposed to be developing, you know, as a family. Um, Now players with better talent, often get longer leashes, right? I mean, Vontez Perfect is a prime example. So it's not really surprising to me that eBay was cut from that standpoint. But I think you have to, you know, set the marker as a head coach that, look, these types of hits are not permitted, not in our practice, not in the offseason, and not during games. Yeah, based on everything I was able to research on him, he was one of those players that was kind of on the fence on if he would actually make the roster or not anyways. So if you show a head coach that you're not able to make wise decisions when going against your teammates in practice, then that's not somebody I'm going to trust to put on the field either. Yeah, you're just a liability. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about some actual fantasy relevant goodness in Carolina. Christian McCaffrey, the near consensus 101 at running back, especially if you're not playing in a super flex league, Christian McCaffrey. After what was essentially a lost season in Carolina last year, CMC says he is confident returning after enduring different injuries and setbacks throughout the 2021 season. He even doubled down on his claim that he said last year before the year started that he would draft himself first overall if he were to play fantasy football. Matthew, do you have any concerns for CMC coming into 2021 off of multiple soft tissue injuries, and are you fading him at all? It's actually interesting because when you ask me this I have Christian McCaffrey as my first running back off the board and I I love him for this year but then as I've been doing best balls and stuff like that I found myself hoping I actually don't have the first pick to have to worry about picking him so my brain is telling me there's nothing to worry about he's going to be fine there's nothing or the injuries were a one-off. He's he's going to be fine this year, but and there's no scientific backing for this, but my heart's kind of telling me I kind of just don't want to have to make that choice with him. 
Yeah, it's a tough spot to be in with a player coming back, especially coming back from soft tissue injuries. We talk about it a lot, previous injuries being a good predictor of future injuries, and we certainly don't hope that for CMC, but it's an unfortunate reality that we got to face. All right, I got one last question for you, and it's a fun question. It's not necessarily injury related. We'll go to you first, Eric. Are you fading Christian McCaffrey this year at all because he has now jinxed himself again by dubbing himself the first overall pick after what happened last year? Oh, absolutely not. I want my first (laughs) picks to be confident in themselves. I would fade him if he had said he'd taken himself in the fifth round. If Christian McCaffrey makes it to the fifth round, people, you better pick him. That's officially a fade. Yeah, (laughs) that's a fade. I don't think that'll be taken as a hot take. (laughs) Matthew, are you fading him because of this at all? I shouldn't be, but I do kind of believe in bad juju and putting stuff out there and not wanting to speak it into existence, especially as an athletic trainer. Often, I can't tell you how many times someone says, oh, I'm having a, you're having a slow day today. And then next thing you know, three people break their arm and I'm running around. So I, I do kind of feel like there's a, there's a possibility he, he jinxed himself here. And now obviously in fantasy, you shouldn't be worrying about this. He's still the first overall pick, but that is a concern to me. I, I believe in bad juju and I think he, could have put some bad juju on himself there. Do you believe in the Madden curse? I did for a little bit, and it's but it seems like it's kind of gotten broken the past few years. But for a while there, I, okay. I actually was actively fading people that were on the cover of Madden. <laughs> Funny enough. And it worked for a while. Shout out the TB12 method for breaking the Madden curse. Everything always comes back to Tom Brady. When you've been in the league for four centuries, it's <laughs> there's some there's some that connection. Crazy. All right. Well, that does it for the NFC South and this episode of the Next Man Up Injury Podcast. Next time we get together, we will dive into the AFC beginning in the East with the Bills, Patriots, Dolphins, and Jets. Now, I need to give a special shout out to my wife for not going into labor during this podcast. I was ex- halfway expecting to be interrupted during this thing. We are at... 39 weeks in six days. So hey. tomorrow is due date. We have an appointment at 1030 in the morning to see the doctor. We'll see what happens. But there may be a little delay between this podcast and the next podcast because we'll be a little bit busy. Yep. Congratulations. Congrats, that would have made well, for you. our very exciting pod had it uh, happened that way, though. <laughs> We're both super ready. She's been a trooper through this whole thing. But over the past couple of weeks, she's like, all right, this girl got to get out of here. So Just take the headset in the car. I was time. I was kind of ready because that would have made some good content, but I'm and glad she's coming she's in out. from the hospital room. Kyle Allen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will most likely be editing this thing at the hospital. We will see, but there may be a little gap. So if you're listening to this and there's a little gap between this episode and the next one, I apologize. Be patient, folks. We'll be back soon with some AFC news. As always, let's close this thing out with our social media tags. Matthew, where can we find you? Can you can finally find me mostly at Fantasy Ferret on Twitter, uh, especially now that work is starting back up, and that is my way to tweet fantasy football nonsense while I'm at work without getting caught by my bosses. So that's what I do. Hopefully they're not listening. If they to are pod. listening, then the pods probably made it super big and I may not be working at the school anymore. So we're good. I love your optimism. You're a sneaky one, Mr. Ferret. Eric, where can we find you on the social, sir? I am the Nighthawk PT. You can find me at FF underscore Nighthawk. All righty. Before I sign off, we have to give one more shout out to a good friend of mine and friend of the podcast, John C., for creating our intro music and outro music. If you're looking for music for your podcast videos or just want to hear some sweet tunes, you can reach out to him at johncmusic at gmail.com. Now that's J-O-N-S-E-E at gmail.com. Please do not email a John C. with an H in his name. That guy is rude. You will not have a good time. Poor John C. with an H. Thanks, John. Again, my name is Kyle Allen. Yeah, don't like that guy. Again, my name is Kyle Allen. You can find me on Twitter at KAllen underscore four. Don't forget to check out RiderDynasty.com for the latest from our writer's room. We've got some great content coming out lately. 
our friend Rob Mongol just posted a, an, an article about George Kittle and why he is a great candidate to trade away from your dynasty squad. And Robert Wu has just posted a list of some of the best players who may be able to avoid COVID this season and you'll get to rely on throughout the year. So if you want to check that out, riderdynasty.com and give us a follow on Twitter at Rider Dynasty. And one last thing before we go, always remember that the best ability is availability. Peace. Also, thanks guys.